Welcome to another episode of Simply Bitcoin, where we cover the Bitcoin news, the catastrophic fails by the central bankers' government shitcoins, the memes, Bitcoin culture in general. We have it all. We're a one stop shop for the Bitcoin revolution today. We have a very special guest, the legendary Stefan Levera. How you doing, Stefan? Hey guys, I'm doing well. Thank you for inviting me. We're super honored to have you. But anyways, Opti, it's time for number time. Brought to you by Noddle. They make some of the best Bitcoin nodes like the Noddle One. Run your own version of Bitcoin Core, the Lightning Network, Whirlpool and Dojo, all from the comfort of your own home. Remember, guys, if you don't run your own Bitcoin node like the Noddle, you're using someone else's. And now if you're a digital nomad, you have no excuse because now you could run a Noddle through a virtual private server using Noddle Cloud. Visit Noddle.eu today. At the time of this recording, the Bitcoin price is at $21,000. $920 sats per dollar, also known as Moscow time, 4,562. Bitcoin held in corporate treasuries, 1,491,000. Bitcoin that went down last week, it was at 1,660,000. Block height, 746,481. Reachable Bitcoin nodes, we want that number to continue going up, 13,615. The amount of Bitcoin, the percentage issued is 90.96%. Blocks to the happening can't get any. I want that. I want that day to come faster. Ninety-three thousand five hundred and nineteen, uh, having estimate April eighteenth, twenty twenty-four. Block subsidy around one hundred and thirty-seven thousand dollars, or six point two five Bitcoin. Now that Stefan is here, I'm gonna pull up a very very interesting video. It's legendary. I want to get Stefan's thoughts on this. This is Augustine Carson. He is the head of the. The BIS, the Bank of International Settlements. And look, he's saying the quiet part out loud. So anyways, let's check out this video. Part our analysis on CBDC in particular for the use of general to the general use, uh, we tend to establish the equivalence with cash. Uh, and there is a huge difference there. Uh, for example, in cash, uh, we don't know, for example, who's using a $100 bill today, we don't know who is using a 1,000 peso bill today. A, a, a key difference in, with the CBDC is that central bank will have absolute control on the rules and regulations that will determine the use of that uh, expression of central bank liability. And also we will have the technology to enforce that. Those, are, those two issues are extremely important and that makes a huge difference with respect to what, she, to what cash is. Uh, our analysis. So, uh, that's absolutely terrifying. I, I don't want to live in that type of future where, you know, the Hamburglar has absolute control of, you know, he says it himself. And who's we? It's a very ominous we. It's like we. It's the royal we. You know, they, they have this whole idea of oh, we. We're a collective, right? They're coming from a very collectivist frame of mind. It's the statist way, and of course, many of us in the Bitcoin space have been commenting on this for literally for years. This is not even new. They have been saying this for a long time. It's been in a bunch of their papers. They have been talking about almost with glee about the ability of enforcing negative rates onto us, the everyday people. And of course, the control, they're called central bank digital currencies, but they should really be called surveillance coins or control coins. And that's that's the reality of it. And I think anyone who believes in freedom should be adopting Bitcoin and encouraging their family and friends to adopt the freedom money, Bitcoin. Absolutely. It, it, Opti. I couldn't have said it better than Stefan. Yeah, I, I, I could say that. that exactly. But I was just going to say, I've, I've been saying this for all week and, and basically since I started the show, then once you guys put it in, in my mind, you accepted the idea that if you reframe everything in the framing of, are they trying to control me? Are they trying to empower me? Then you know exactly where their incentives are. And guys, he said it himself. They are trying to control you with CBDCs. Therefore, as Stefan says, you should be buying freedom money, guys. Come on. Yeah, absolutely. Stefan, so we all know this is the last attempt. This is the last gasp. Uh, CBDCs wouldn't even be a thing if it wasn't for Bitcoin. Um, how far will governments take this? How far will they go? We all know that Bitcoin's incentives are just stronger. It's just better. If, if people have a choice between um, 
between some a surveillance coin, a, a coin that they could debase at their own will, um, or something that can't be debased, something that is censorship resistant like Bitcoin, people are just going to always pick the freedom option, right? Um, but I think that governments are definitely going to use coercion to try to, or and propaganda as well, to be frank, to try to incept whole swaths of the population to try to use these these uh, these currencies, these these central bank digital currencies, or also like I like to call them shit coins, central bank shit coins. Of course. Um, and then if you kind of add the theory from the sovereign individual, he was basically making the argument that the people in the future that were still going to suffer from inflation and capital controls are going to be poor people, right? Um, do you believe that's the case, or do you because Bitcoin really levels the playing field. So what are your thoughts on the response from governments trying to remain relevant because this is their last attempt at that? And do you agree with the sovereign individual that it's poor people that are still going to be stuck using government money? Let's hope it's available for everybody. Let's hope the freedom money is available for every, everybody. But as you rightly pointed out, we wouldn't even be talking, people wouldn't even be talking about CBDCs if it weren't for Bitcoin. The reality is that money today is already digital. If you look at the fraction of money that is made up of cash and coins, it's a tiny fraction of money. Most money is already dollars on a bank account somewhere. And those records should just be treated as they are already being reported or given to tax authorities, law enforcement, etc. And probably a lot of that data, they'll say it's de-anonymized, but I'm sure a lot of that data is already being fed to financial surveillance units inside central banks around the world, inside treasury departments around the world, and to entities like the BIS, the IMF, etc. So yeah, but ultimately, of course, Bitcoin is available to anybody on a smartphone today. That's true. Anyone can just spin up a wallet on a phone and take payment. And so I am hopeful that more and more people will realize the difference between freedom money and CBDCs. Uh, of course, there will be ways. They'll have all kinds of ways to try to push people into that system. They want to keep you in there. Just like how Facebook wants to keep you inside their system so that you keep clicking and they can serve you ads. They may try to integrate CBDCs into everything. So probably look at China as an example. They will probably integrate it into the WeChat and the WePay and all these super apps. And so I think that's probably one direction and one angle that they will likely try. Uh, but it is up to those people building and developing a Bitcoin for freedom and for anybody to use and not just for the, let's say, the elites of society to use. Absolutely. Stefan, is this a winnable fight? Right. Because I think, you know, I, I, I definitely think that in the long term it is, but it's really scary. Um, and the, the you know, in, in, and it's it's fascinating how the theory from the sovereign individual is playing out. Right. That he is his, basically he was saying that in countries that you would never have imagined this happening, including Western democracies that, you know, according to them, has the rule of law. They have breaking all broken all those standards. I think we had a sneak peek of that in the situation that happened in Canada. Um, do you agree with that? So, I think that there will be different countries who are very pro Bitcoin, right? Obviously, examples like El Salvador and things like this, where they are just pro, like letting people use Bitcoin or whatever wallet they want. They're not forcing you to use their one. There'll be other countries that start their own shitcoin, unfortunately, like, you know, Central African Republic. Uh, there'll be others who just say, look, it's anything goes, you can, you know, just it's legal tender. You can choose. So I really think we'll see that. And look, I think there are interesting examples in places like Nigeria or Pakistan. After the central banks there or governments there made moves against Bitcoin, peer to peer markets just went huge. So that's another way that things can go. And ultimately, People can just be at home earning money online. You might be a web developer or a programmer in Nigeria, or you might just be a blue collar worker who just earns some money in Bitcoin, or you might just do some odd jobs on the side, some side hustle for Bitcoin. I think the global decentralized movement of Bitcoin. So, I mean, it's important to understand there's Bitcoin, the technology and the users, and then there's this movement of, of people who 
are organizing Bitcoin meetups or they're hosting Bitcoin shows. They're trying to do Bitcoin education or they're developing and contributing to Bitcoin code. They're building Bitcoin businesses. A lot of those people are ideologically aligned with the idea, let's say, broadly speaking, the cypherpunk and libertarian way of thinking. Maybe not everybody agrees on every little thing, but broadly speaking, they believe in this monetary freedom. So I think if you sum all of those people up around the world, that's a big enough market for Bitcoin to have a, a base, let's say, a base of users, hodlers, uh, people who are interacting in that system and who will defend that system. So you don't, but you don't believe that, you know, and this is the theory that Svetsky came up with, um, and, you know, the excellent article, We Are the Remnant. You don't believe that for Bitcoin to work or for a Bitcoin standard to be implemented, um, not everybody has to adopt it. Is that correct? Yeah, so I think at the start, it'll be more like remnant types. But I think eventually, I guess it does depend on where what you think, uh, where you think Bitcoin is going. But I think it, it will eventually hit that point where people are basically forced to use Bitcoin because if you just use anything else, you're just going your value is going down over time. But that said, even today there is fiat currency. There are legal tender laws today. There are many countries that mandate that you use their currency for payments, or they mandate that you pay taxes in that currency. But ultimately, if it's just serving a role as a utility coin, well. The answer is simple, save in Bitcoin and then only transact in the utility coin at the last moment that you need it for mm. it, you need for that utility. Otherwise, you're saving in Bitcoin. And what gotcha. does that do long term? It makes it hard for government to cheaply fund themselves. So they will have to right size. And I think, so I think we're seeing this uh, play out. Of course, Bitcoin is small today, right? We're, we're, it's, it's tiny today. What is it? Like at a, I can't remember the number, but it's something like 450 billion as a total market today. Of course, I think that will have to grow. Um, but yeah, I, I don't necessarily think it'll be only for the remnant. Of course, I've been talking about the remnant stuff for a while, and I think they, they are the base who are most important to sort of energize, get them on board. Uh, but they'll find you, right? That was the whole idea of Albert J. Nock. And in that article, um, he, he was sort of saying they're just out there and they will find you. You put out that message and they'll find you. Absolutely. Fascinating. Very good conversation. Anyways. Opti, it's time for The Daily News. Brought to you by CryptoCloaks.com. They make some of the best 3D printed Bitcoin merch, like the famous 3D printed Bitcoin grenade toy. Comes in any custom color your heart desires. That's right. You want in Peter Schiff colors, it comes in gold. You can take advantage of the promo code down below to get 5% off. The European store is now open. Check out CryptoCloaks.com. This was a fascinating article by Bloomberg. There's a lot of signal in here and who else to, to talk about it, about Stefan. Stefan's here today and perhaps he could break it down a little bit because at the end of the day, Opti and I are just plebs. Um, let's check it out. Morgan Stanley says, buy, uh, buy Salvadorian bonds battered by Bitcoin bet. Morgan Stanley is ready to scoop up battered bonds from battered bonds from El Salvador, which are some of the worst performing notes this year, as the president's bet on Bitcoin backfires. The government's 7.7 .7 billion in euro bonds have been overly punished by the markets, despite El Salvador having better metrics than other distressed peers. Simon Weaver, the global head of emerging market sovereign credit strategy at the bank, wrote in a note on Tuesday. Markets are clearly pricing in a high probability of the autarky, that's a real word, autarky. scenario. Thank you, Stefan, in which El Salvador defaults, but there is no restructuring. What would happen if El Salvador defaults, Stefan? Or because I, I see them getting really close to Bitfinex and I see them getting really close to Bitcoiners, would, would, would that be bad, Stefan? What's going on there? So. This is one of those situations where, as a libertarian, you might be conflicted because in one sense, you want Bitcoin adoption, but in another sense, this whole idea is around government debt and they are selling government debt. And this is a, right, obviously with the Bitcoin bond, you're helping fund the government. So I think I can understand there will be, understandably, there'll be very different views in the community about whether that should be supported or not. Uh, obviously, this comment... And this article is not talking about the Bitcoin bonds directly. It's talking about their normal, like the normie bonds. But it's just commenting about how 
the views of the fiat market participants are, let's say, not that bullish on El Salvadorian uh, or Salvadoran government bonds. So where where does it all uh, wash out? Well, I think one aspect that's interesting is to see that El Salvador have enabled a lot more tourism because of having Bitcoin. I'm, I guess, cautiously optimistic that that trend continues and carries on. We'll see. Uh, but as to whether people should be buying the Salvadoran Bitcoin bond, I don't know. I mean, it might be interesting, um, the whole residence play as well, this whole idea of, hey, if you you know, buy a certain quantity of Bitcoin bond, that would you want a residence to go and live in El Salvador? So, you know, interesting stuff, but I think it is kind of seen like, hey, the fiat world is, uh, the participants in the fiat normal bond world are sort of making their statement clear about what they view, the how they view the viability of the Salvadoran government and the, their ability to repay government bonds. Do you think it also might be an ideological uh, issue as well because we know for example not only has tourism gone up we know that the gdp growth in 2021 was the largest and i think since like 1960 something uh not to mention that the cap the 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 murder murder per 100,000 people is is reaching historic lows as well so in that article kind of hinted to it right people are are being overly pessimistic on El Salvador. Um, I think so you might be right there. Yeah, I think you might be, but but it's hard for me to say because I, I've been to El Salvador just one time. I wouldn't say I'm an expert on the country, but definitely from what it seems like, it seems like Bukela has been trying to crack down on the gangs and stop the crime, but he also has detractors. There are other people saying, oh, look, he's shutting down journalists and things like this. But at the same time, if you look at people like Max Kaiser and Stacey Herbert, you know, they're in the country and they're, they're often, they're based there and they're often talking about how great things are there. So who do you, who do you, um, who do you believe? I'm, I'm probably tending towards believing Max and Stacey, but who really knows? Yeah, exactly. So the last part of this article, I think, is where there's a ton of signal. Um, and I want to check this out. And I think it's a great conversation to have with Stefan. And it says... Um, for a restructuring to work, it nearly always needs the IMF involved or there to be a clear push for reform by the government. Given this may not be the setup in a potential restructuring, it could easily end up being a protracted negotiation. So if you look at Argentina, right, one of the staples, one of the requirements for the bailout there was the IMF forced the Argentinian government to de-incentivize the use of Bitcoin and shit coins within its borders, even though Argentina, I think, has like something like 60 or 70 percent inflation. And another piece of signal there, guys, is why is it all these the IMF? Why do why is the IMF required? What is going on here? Um, and then that kind of explains why the IMF is so hostile towards something like Bitcoin. Because I think it really has to come down to if the IMF is always the bailout of last resort and Bitcoin could potentially provide another alternative without chains, it could explain that thing. But why? And all these yeah. legacy articles, whether it's the Financial Times, whether it's Bloomberg, every single time... And an, an announcement gets made by El Salvador using Bitcoin or Bitcoin bonds. They always ask the IMF or the World Bank for a comment, right? Um, <laughs> and I think that really shows a lot. So, Stefan, what are your thoughts on that last paragraph? Because it, it's really revealing if you part the noise and you part the actual and what is who's involved there, what the IMF's role is, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, this is down to decades of fiat propagandizing and the fiat system encouraging its own players to the detriment of other people. And entities like the IMF, the World Bank, the BIS, these are just these intra government, you know, in, uh, these supranational level in, you know, government en uh, funded entities. These are taxpayer funded entities, but they're all to basically help manage the fiat shit show. If the world would be a lot simpler if people just simply used Bitcoin. But here's the thing. In a world of fractional reserve banking, they need a lender of last resort. And in a global world, they need these entities 
because they're taking money in from, say, the US or other governments, again, taxpayer money, uh, and they are then giving it out as loans. Now, there's this element of, let's say, colonialism or whatever you want to call it, or where they impose things on that country and say, hey, I'll give you a bailout loan, but I want X, Y, and Z done. And that's also what that component is getting at in that article where they're saying, hey, if you want, uh, if you want this IMF restructure money, you're going to have to do what we say. And so there's an element of control and there's an element of disruption here for the IMF, the BIS, the World Bank, because in a Bitcoin world, I think it's going to be full reserve. We're, going to not, we're not going to have fractional reserve. We're not going to have a central bank. We're not going to have a lender of last resort. It'll be no bailouts. And that's literally in the genesis block of Bitcoin. The, you know, Chancellor on the brink of second bailout for banks. The pro- part of the problem was bailouts, as in government bailouts, to be clear. So, yeah, I think ultimately, they, their system is predicated on this idea of fiat and central banks and lenders of last resort, and they need to be able to print the money for that to work. Otherwise, it's, it's just not a practical thing in practice. No private entity is just going to say, oh, okay, I'll just like give you my coins. No, they're, they're going to say, these are the terms on which you can have debt. And so I, I think in some cases here, it may be a little bit of short-term pain for long-term gain for El Salvador. So I think they are taking that short-term pain, but the long-term gain of teaching people in the country about Bitcoin, and we have projects like My First Bitcoin out there trying to teach school kids about Bitcoin, they are going to be so much more advanced and in a better position to adapt to the reality of Bitcoin uh being adopted around the world. Absolutely. Opti, you want to chime in before we move on to the next topic? Well, as a proud Bitcoin propagandist, I can recognize propaganda very easily. And this is nothing more than just a hit piece, guys. Of course, they invoke the IMF at the end. It, it's just a standard playbook by Bloomberg. And thanks for Stefan to break it down because this is not my forte. So I will pass it back to you guys. <laughs> And that's what makes Simply Bitcoin so dangerous, is that we're plebs with the Bloomberg subscription. Anyways, moving on to the next topic. Let's check it out. This was a press release or a blog post by Paul Gurrell. He is the chief legal officer at Coinbase. And we actually reported on this last week. But the implications of this are striking. Um, So anyways, let's read some of the article and of course... We're going to get Stefan's opinion and Stefan's going to break it down, what the implications of the whole security situation are. Anyways, let's check it out. Earlier today, following a Department of Justice investigation to former Coinbase employees' misuse of confidential Coinbase information related to listing decisions, the Securities and Exchange Commission separately filed securities fraud charges against the individual related to this wrongdoing. It's funny because when Nancy Pelosi and the Fed do it, the insider trading, just a slap on the wrist. When everybody else does it, ah, you're a criminal. The SEC alleges that nine digital assets involved are securities. The DOJ reviewed the same facts and chose not to file securities fraud charges against those involved. A CFTC commissioner, uh, Caroline Pham, stated this is a striking example of regulation by enforcement, which is weird. Um, Seven of the nine assets included by the SEC's charges are listed on Coinbase's platform. None of those assets are securities. Coinbase has a rigorous process to analyze and review each digital asset before making it available on our exchange, a process that the SEC itself has reviewed. This process includes an analysis of whether the asset could be considered to be a security and also considers regulatory compliance and information security aspects of the asset. To be explicit, the majority of assets that we review are not ultimately listed on Coinbase. Here's the signal, guys. We cooperated with the SEC's investigation into the wrongdoing charged by the DOJ today, but instead of having a dialogue with us about the seven assets on our platform, the SEC jumped directly to litigation. The SEC charges put a spotlight on an important problem. The U.S. doesn't have a clear or workable regulatory framework for digital asset securities. And instead of crafting tailored rules in an inclusion or transparent way, the SEC is relying on these types of one-off enforcement actions to try to bring all digital assets into its jurisdiction, even those assets that are not securities. Now, why is Coinbase going to the defense of an employee that clearly was insider trading? It's simple. Because Coinbase's whole business model would be completely under threat if 
a lot of these shit coins that we know are securities or deemed securities. We know Ethereum and Michael Saylor had an incredible video where he went, I think it was on Altcoin Daily, and they asked him, hey, Saylor, do you think Ethereum is, and he just broke it down, the pre-sale, the fact that Ethereum, that Vitalik could just snap his finger, change the whole algorithm. And I think that this case puts all that under threat, which is why you have the head of legal at Coinbase literally going out and defending a scumbag that was caught insider trading, literally buying up tokens before they were listed on the exchange so that he could dump them later on. Right, so this whole thing is just clown world. Um, but again, I don't think that the Cynthia Lummis crypto bill is gonna fix any of that because in the Cynthia Lummis crypto bill, she still included Ethereum as a commodity, which it clearly isn't. So this is just, I don't even know what to think. I don't know how this is gonna get resolved, but I don't like that the US government is not going through legislation. They're just going directly to enforcement. And it's law enforcement that's getting to decide what is a security, what is not a security. This whole thing is a disaster. Uh, Stefan, what are your thoughts on this? What do you think the, the long-term implications of a case like this are? Um, I think this was the first recorded case of insider trading in the crypto industry. Yeah, so a few thoughts. First of all, first of all, some of this stuff was rumored for years about Coinbase, right? This was like in the industry, everyone, it was kind of like everyone sort of heard these rumors. Like you couldn't have been in this industry for very long without hearing these kinds of rumors about all these kinds of like dodgy practices at exchanges, offshore, or potentially even in the US. So, you know, this was coming, right? This was coming. Secondly, I think important to note, from a libertarian point of view, because before people kind of accuse us as being like SEC cheerleaders, I am a libertarian. I do believe abolish the SEC. Like, first off, yeah, like I believe in abolishing the SEC. However, I also think we can recognize that, look, these laws aren't going away and the SEC is likely to, uh, you know, the government is likely to see these as securities because, you know, they've said this. If you look at the public commentary of people like Gary Gensler, he has. I mean, he doesn't go out and explicitly say it, but if you, I think if you read between the lines and if you read him carefully, it does sound like he is very confident to say Bitcoin is a commodity, but he's pretty much not giving much uh, in terms of whether the any other coins are commodities, which means they might be securities. And so it's important for people to really think about that and really... Uh, you know, and here's the other thing. There's this idea of like legally, what is it? But you can also just think about it like conceptually, what are they? Uh, and I think in like, even if we, again, I'm not a lawyer, but if let's set, let's set aside the whole legal aspect of it economically and just in general, like how they operate, a lot of these altcoins operate more like a company. And guess what? Company is like equity, right? It's like, you know, you're earning shares in a company. Um, so, but here's the thing with shit coins, you don't get, an actual ownership right in the company. And that's the that's the real scam, isn't it? So I think it's a, a time to be wary with altcoins. Uh, of course, I work at Swan. You know, I, I'm a big fan of the Bitcoin-only approach. I think that is the smart way to go about these things. Uh, I don't claim any special legal expertise, though. So, you know, what happens in the government, well, you know, that that's going to happen. You're muted. Sorry about that, guys. So we'll stay on top of it. I think that the implications of this case are big. Um, and that's why the head of legal of Coinbase is trying to get trying to defend a criminal, basically, uh, because I think Coinbase's whole business model is uh, is based on selling shit coins like that's their whole business model. Um, and if a lot of them are deemed securities, they're in trouble. Um, even liability wise as well, right? Um, anyways, uh, Opti, what are your thoughts before we move on to the fail? Well, this reminded me of a tweet that Not Grubbles put out and it was on the lines of, no, it's not a security. No, it's not pre-mined. No, there isn't a company that pumps the coin for profit. No, it doesn't fail the Howey test. Guys, the signs are everywhere. Coinbase is wrecked. Coinbase has been in the news and they, the, the wreckness of Coinbase keeps piling up and it's just not looking good for Coinbase. That's why they're out here trying to do PR. 
because they know they're in deep trouble. Wouldn't want to be on Coinbase right now. Yep, exactly. It, it's so messed up that Coinbase is willing to defend a criminal to try to save their own butts. We're at that part of the movie, which is absolutely crazy. But anyways, Opti, it's time for it. The Daily Fail. Brought to you by SwanBitcoin.com. Swan is the best way to build your Bitcoin stack with automated Bitcoin savings plans and instant purchases serving clients of any size from $10 to $10 million. Guys, the reason that we recommend Swan at Simply Bitcoin is because they align with our values. They incentivize you to take self-custody with their auto withdrawal, and they incentivize you to dollar cost average, which spreads out your uh, your risk. Best place to stack sats, swanbitcoin.com. What's up, guys? I'm here for the fail, and I was going to do this over the weekend, but it just happens that we didn't have enough time, and we got Stefan Levera. So perfect guess. Anyways, let's get into this headline. It goes, Sri Lankan president resigns by my email after fleeing to Singapore. This happened July 14th, 2022. And this is this is just ridiculous. Anyways, Sri Lankan president Gotabaya Rajapaksa, sorry, Optimus can't speak, has tendered his resignation in a letter sent by email to parliamentary speaker. He landed in Singapore after there was a wake of anti-government protests and he resigned via email so he pledged to quit over the weekend because i know you guys saw the twitter videos they were having a pool party in his palace it looked really fun anyways the same day he resigned he appointed the ex-prime minister as the new acting president so remember this fail that we covered a while ago Oh, wait, wrong one. This one, sorry. This was by Jack Posobiec. And remember when we covered this, that the World Economic Forum had put out an article by the Sri Lankan Prime Minister that this is how we will fix my country and make it rich by 2025. And the fail that we covered is they deleted it. They deleted the tweet or the article. And so I went in, looked at the article, and as you can see, Sri Lankan Prime Minister this guy, Ranel Wickramengsheng, as you can see, is dated <laughs> August 29th. And here's the first, first paragraph, and I'm reading this for a reason. This is an important moment in Sri Lanka's development as the country continues to deliver on its plan for economic development and stands on the cusp of a transition to a knowledge-based economy. Since the country and its people saw a vibrant transition, its political landscape in January 2015, Sri Lanka has put in place many of the building blocks needed to reinvigorate its social, economic, and political architecture. Well, this is on the Wayback Machine, so I went in to dive a little deeper to make sure what was going on on the WE Forum. So here's the tweet with the original link dated September 3rd, 2018, and the link works again, guys. So they put the article back up on the website, same date, October. August 29, 2018, Sri Lanka Prime Minister, this is how I'll make my country rich by 2025. What is interesting is that they updated it without adding an update to the article. So they just kind of tried to sneak this by and it says, Renel is the current acting president of Sri Lanka. He assumed the position after his predecessor fled the country amid protests over the country's economic crisis. And as you can tell, he was the prime minister. Now, I am just the lowly pleb, and when I read this, it was early, and I was just like, wait, what is going on? So I found another lowly pleb substack, and he covered this, and he wrote a postscript just to make sure I wasn't losing my mind. I know you plebs out there are following the CERN story, and I was just like, yo, what is going on right now? Anyways, as you can see, they re-added the article a few days after you got the the news that they had deleted the article so correlation is not causation but a day or two after attention was drawn to the unfortunate irony of the 2018 article in light of the current situation in sri lanka it disappeared and then a day or two after attention was drawn to the unfortunate disappearance of the 2018 article it reappeared so again I almost lost my mind and I had to make sure that these dates were right. And of course, say what you want about Wikipedia, but they try to keep you up to date at least. So here he is, Renel Rickman Singe. Uh, 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 hold on a second. How do you, how do you actually pronounce that? 
uh, Ranil Wickramasinghe. That, thank you. Wickramasinghe. Thank you, Stefan. Okay. I appreciate Apologies, it. Apologies, guys. Apologies. So, so I had to make sure he did become the president July 21st, 2022. Amazing. So they backdated it and didn't say anything about it. And as you can see from the We Forum, he is a World Economic Forum member. So as you saw in the beginning, guys, new president of Sri Lanka is a member of the We. What a coincidence. New boss, same as the old boss. Amazing. Anyways, it just so happens that the day that we covered this, we got Stefan Levera and it reminded me of one of your tweets. I was born in Sri Lanka, and though I'm now an Australian citizen, I'm very disappointed in the total incompetence of the Sri Lankan government. They have basically run the country into the ground with a combo of incompetence and corruption, guys. So, new boss, same as the old boss. They ran the economy to death via very bad ESG policies and corruption. And now they are a collapsed economy and they just put in a new WEF global leader to control the country, guys. This is the type of people we are dealing with. This is the type of propaganda we are dealing with. And we already know what's going on and what the true story is. But I'm just a lowly pleb from the United States. So I don't have much uh, intel on what is actually going on on that side of the world, but I can tell you what is going on on the front of propaganda. The WEF is pushing hard that they aren't making mistakes and they are backdating articles to make it look like they are actually winning, guys. This is a complete fail and it's actually atrocious. Like the journalistic integrity of them, it, it's a slap in the face. Anyways, Nico, what's your thoughts? Yeah, man, great. So great, like, just like going back, finding out that they're changing stuff. The the infamous uh, article by, you know, the WEF, the, you know, you owe nothing and be happy. That was literally scrubbed off the face of the internet. But they don't know you can't scrub anything off the face of the internet. It always lives on. Um, there you go. They're, they're doing it again. Um, Stefan, is this a case of central planning doing what central planning always does? And absolutely failing because that's what it always does. It, do, is it true? Because I, I did see a lot of rumors being pushed by, you know, conservative media and the conservative accounts about how, oh, this is ESG, the cause of, you know, the, the collapse of the Sri Lankan government. What happened? What, what actually happened? What's yeah, going so, on? So, yeah, so I was born in Sri Lanka, but I was raised in Australia. But obviously I have family and stuff back in Sri Lanka. And so the history of the country right there was a big civil war so this is like a civil war between the tamil component of the population and the Sin sinhalese population and so the wickram so the uh the gotabaya family they were like a ruling family and so they had you know uh one brother was the president another brother was the prime minister another brother was like the finance minister like the son of this other one was some other minister and things like this so they at the time were popular for stopping or I guess, uh, militarily winning the tam the civil war. And the history, the context here is that Sri Lanka obviously was a poor country. And during that time from, let's say, the 2010s, there was a big rise in tourism in Sri Lanka. So it was really, quote unquote, booming. But at the same time, there was a lot of corruption and there was a lot of just uh, beggar the neighbor sort of taking all this debt from China and uh, things like this for the Belt and Road project. They were taking all this debt and they were spending it in very reckless ways. They had a very big government relative to the size of you know the GDP and they were spending on all these crazy things like a stadium or an airport or a park here and a, you know these different projects that ended up being like a vanity project. And so that's part of the corruption. And then you would hear about corruption as well in terms of who got the contract for things, right? So they so for example these super expensive roads and things like this where let's say the person connected was someone connected to the government and they were the one getting the contract, right? So this is the kind of thing that was going on. Now, in terms of the recent, you know, what went on. So it was a combination of things, right? There was a big bomb blast that killed, that stopped a lot of the tourism. And I believe that was in 2018 or 2019. And then on top of that, there was this whole ESG nonsense with stopping the fertilizer. And yes, they did try to walk it back later, but the damage was already done. And, this is a country where rice is the main thing people eat. Like, it's a staple. It's an Asian country, for obvious reasons. Rice is a big staple. And Sri Lanka used to export rice. And then, because of all this craziness, they were now importing rice. 
add to that the crazy lockdowns of because of hysteria 19 they were doing lockdowns and stopping all the tourists basically and so that was their way of getting foreign currency usd that they then used to pay all these loans so it was just like hit after hit after hit you know double whammy triple whammy after losing the tourism after doing like uh, committing economic suicide with these crazy esg work policies you know uh, uh, it, it just added insult to injury right it was just like worse and worse and worse and then basically the country got to this point and that's where why there was this big protest and now the who was previously the prime minister ranil wickremesinghe is now in the president role and he's going to serve out the rest of gotabaya's uh um gotabaya rajapaksa's term until they have a new vote uh at that point for the for the nation the problem is the country is just in such a big level of debt that you know they just can't afford things so they're trying to now they're trying to get things going again they've got fuel shipments coming in but for a long time there were these massive lines for fuel this is what the ESG people are doing they're trying to devolve the country in a way like there are people who are going around on bikes but as in push bikes because they can't fuel up their tuk-tuk so they can't you know they can't do a business so it's no way to run an economy of course um, part of that is just you know people have socialist beliefs like it like if you read the name it's literally the democratic socialist republic of sri lanka so mm. that's uh unfortunate in that way but you know I, of course i mean there were free there were businesses and stuff like that and i'm i guess conflicted right because obviously i was born there i've got family there i'm hoping they can recover but you know uh, it's not looking too great we'll see so Important question, because this is a Bitcoin show after all, and you are describing a lot of problems that I believe can Bitcoin fix this, Stefan? <laughs> well, of course. So I think for anyone who does use it, of course, you, you know, if you can save for the long term, then yes. Now, I, I, I speak to family and stuff in the country, but for many of them, if they're operating that close to this uh, subsistence line, they don't have a lot that they can save. But that said, there are people using Bitcoin to save. And I think it's one of those things where people might not necessarily be that open about it. So there might be people who are just saving quietly and they're using peer-to-peer -peer platforms to, to buy Bitcoin or earn Bitcoin. So it does exist. Uh, there are people using it, but I think it's just one of those things where they, they're, and rightly so, their priorities are more on things like making sure they can put food on the table uh, and uh, things like this. And that's that's part of the reality of uh, developing countries is that people just are poorer. That said, there are you know people who definitely can benefit from using Bitcoin, transacting with Bitcoin. Uh, so you know, uh, I'm I'm hopeful to see more Bitcoin adoption as as I am around the world. Absolutely. So it doesn't fix it 100, percent but for those that choose to go on a Bitcoin standard, those better said that can afford to, um, it will help, and that's good news, right? So at least it makes the world a better place. But anyways, Opti. It's time for Daily Meme Review. Brought to you by Citadel 21. It's the best Bitcoin cultural zine and stories, articles, comics by actual Bitcoiners. This is the artwork for volume 11. This is the artwork for volume 10. And this is the artwork for volume 2. There's only a thousand physical copies made per volume. Get your prints of Citadel 21 today before they run out. All right, guys, I'm here for the meme review. And of course, I'm going to start this one by our boy Gigi, just because I absolutely love this meme and it cracked me up. And Gigi <laughs> goes, knock, knock, open up. It's Jesus. Better not be trading shit coins in there. <laughs> okay. All right. Next one. This one's by at Bitcoin Kook. I love this one. You guys know me. I surf. I love the ocean. So he goes, true for me at least. The world is a mess. I will commit to the immediate pleasure surfing provides only. And it's an NPC with the mask and he's crying behind the happy mask. And then it's the Chad. Yes. And he goes, hashtag, I am building with laser eyes. Let's go. Next, it's my boy Ropium. He's been killing it. And it goes, it's a feature and it's the bell curve. This one, we all know what this meme is, but left side of the bell curve, NGU, the midwits, Bitcoiners are so rude. And then the right side of the bell curve. It's scarcity and decentralization are unmatched. Toxicity is a feature, not a bug. Opti and I are on the left side. Stefan's on the right side. <laughs> <laughs> nah, man, I'm on the left side as well. <laughs> okay, guys. Sometimes memes aren't just pictures. Sometimes memes are words. And I saw this one. 
and I think this is a perfect meme by Giacomo. Love Giacomo. And he goes, Bitcoin doesn't need mass adoption. The masses need Bitcoin adoption. Fully believe this. Fully love that meme. Here we go, another one. Shout out to Love is Bitcoin. And this meme is people driving in a car, spouses, they're dating, or wife and husband. And the husband driving goes, Bitcoin is 50K again. And the wife goes, why don't you sell some this time? And he kicks her out of the car, and it's the Leonardo DiCaprio laughing. <laughs> okay. Again, guys, you know, sometimes memes aren't just funny. Sometimes memes paint a picture that tell you a story of a thousand words. So shout out to BTC Reserve because they put this meme out. And this is one of those memes that the shit coiners out there need to see, but they don't see enough. So the quote unquote decentralization is a spectrum mantra distracts from the only question that counts. Is a network decentralized beyond the point where a coordinated attack by one or more nation states could kill it? That's why we Bitcoin. And as you can see, there's a spectrum here from 0% decentralization to 100% decentralization. And all altcoins are on the spectrum under 100% where governments can kill it, except for Bitcoin. The one true coin, orange coin good, because it is fully decentralized and governments can't kill it. And we've seen this happen because we already know the bounty on Bitcoin, the price of Bitcoin, the market cap of Bitcoin is the treasure if you can crack Bitcoin and hack it. But hey, they haven't been able to do it in 13 years and I don't think they can. So, shouts out to you guys, awesome memes. And let me figure out what my score is. Oh, oh, I just dropped it. I got this half used fork that I that I used to eat my breakfast really quick before I got on the show. <laughs> Anyways, Nico and Stefan, what is your meme review uh. score? Uh, I got a I got a cold card here. Yeah, that's a, I got my cold card. <laughs> that, that's a great that's a great score. Never go wrong. I already gave it a simply Bitcoin sticker, but I'm gonna give it two simply right. Bitcoin stickers, and one is upside down. Woo! Anyways, guys, we want to know if you agree with the scores you disagree. Let us know down in the comment section. Comment, 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 comment. Make sure to subscribe to us on alternative video platforms because we do talk shit about the World Economic Forum. Like Rumble.com, our personal favorite, BitcoinTV.com. Make sure to join our awesome Telegram group. You could link us some memes to review on the Telegram group so you could link, you could review the memes. It's awesome. And make sure to tune into, make sure to stay until after the show because Jacob from Swan and Opti are doing a live Q&A hangout. It's gonna be awesome. But anyways, Opti, there was a website by Plebe. Why don't you show everybody? Website by Plebe. Brought to you by CypherSafe. Guys, don't store your seed on paper. Paper will burn, paper will get wet, a dog will eat your paper, it's gonna suck. What you wanna do is you wanna store your Bitcoin seed on metal. Yeah, that's right. Metal is, well, not all metal, but cypher safe metal, like the cypher wheel, like the cypher grid, is fireproof, waterproof, pet proof, it's tamper evident, it's badass. Don't be that guy that lost their seed in paper. What if you have a boating accident, you lose your seed, if it walls in the water, paper sucks, but if it's a metal, at least you could go dive in, diving in for it. Anyways, guys, check out cyphersafe.io today. All right, everybody, the website by Plebe is borderwalls.com. Now users can make their own entra entrapocalypse, random secured randomized grid of all BIP39 compliant seed words and then apply a memorable pattern, which only they know to create a wallet. So it's, a, it's, it's an easy way to, uh, to memorize a seed phrase, but by, by visualization rather than trying to memorize 24 words. We still don't recommend that. <laughs> but again, if you're in a tricky subject, especially if you're a refugee, you're trying to flee the country, you know you're going to pass through a hostile customs officer or whatever. Hey, man, uh, I think this is a good way, right? At the end of the day, Bitcoin is a tool, um, but you got to use the tool at the end of the day. Anyways, make sure to subscribe to our audio platforms like Anchor, like Apple Podcasts, like Fountain, all of that good stuff. Also, make sure to check out Simply Bitcoin's blog, www.simplybitcoin.news. And of course, check out our awesome clothing sponsor, Represent. 
ltd.com. Opti and I wear the hoodies every single day. Opti's wearing the t-shirt today. I'm wearing the hoodie. He's coming out with Simply Bitcoin merch. Bitcoin merch, definitely wanna check it out. And also, very special shout out to the legendary Bitcoin podcaster, Stefan Lavera. You can go give him a follow at Stefan Lavera. And of course, we will put a link down to his podcast down in the link in the description of the video. Anyways, guys, that was our show. If you enjoyed the show, you want to do smack that like button. Of course, if you want to continue hearing the Bitcoin news from the plea pleb perspective and the catastrophic fails of the central bankers, governments, shitcoiners, all of it, the memes, the Bitcoin culture, all of it, make sure to subscribe to Simply Bitcoin. We'll see you tomorrow, guys, for a brand new episode. Opt out of control money and save freedom money.